from Studio D. Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us today. And, and today we're going to cover the entire book of Judah, which is only a very short book. It only contains one chapter. But it's long on information that is very, very important, especially for this final generation because it covers something that has happened in the distant past having to do with fallen angels that is about to happen again, which makes it very interesting. The name Jude is the Greek for the name Judah, and this particular Jude and his brother James are both half-brothers to Jesus Christ. So <clears throat> with all that in mind, Jude chapter 1 and verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. <clears throat> to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Okay? A lot being said there. So this letter is addressed to those who have been sanctified. What does that mean? That means these people have been set aside by God for a specific purpose. And called, which means they were chosen by God even before the foundation of this world. And interestingly, the word elect, I use it a lot, it's in the King James Bible, the word elect actually means chosen. So every time you see the elect or election, you can fill in the blank and call it chosen because that's who you are, okay? So the elect of God were called by Him and they have a purpose in this flesh life. And that is who this book is is addressed to. So this pretty well covers all of our Dove Point uh, audience out there across the country. <laughs> Verse 2. Mercy unto you, Jude writes, and peace and love be multiplied. Think about that. Multiplied love in your life. And all of God's elect, they know this one thing, that when you stay in God's Word on a regular basis, okay, then you are naturally going to have that grace and that peace of mind. And I guarantee you, love will be multiplied to you in your life. You cannot miss if you stay in the Word. Understanding God's Word will bring you these good things in life that quite frankly, money cannot buy. Can't buy those things. Now, in verses 3 and 4, that's who the book's addressed to. In verses 3 and 4, Jude is going to explain the purpose for writing this letter, and it's a warning, really. You're going to find out he started out to write a nice little letter about salvation and how wonderful it is and all that, but he, gets, he starts to write the letter, and then the Holy Spirit spurns him, and he changes his mind. He'll tell you about it here. <clears throat> and he really he gives us a warning. Verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you <clears throat> that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Who are the saints? It's all the set-aside ones. It's all the election that came before Him from Adam all the way down to the apostles. Okay, that's, that's who, it, who they are. And, <clears throat> and what He's saying here is, when I sat down to write this letter, I really intended to write you about the salvation that we all have through Christ, both Jew and Gentile. That's what the common salvation is. It's common to every person alive, Jew and Gentile. <clears throat> but instead of writing that, he said, I found it necessary <clears throat> and I was compelled to write to you an urgent appeal. Now, that's an exhortation. An exhortation is an urgent appeal or better said, a warning. And here's the warning that you remember the former things of old and how our ancestors in the faith had to contend for the faith. 
That is, they had to fight for the sum of our Christians' belief against fallen angels. Bringing to your remembrance things that happened in the past. Why? So that you and I will know what is going to happen in the future. <clears throat> and here's what he follows that line up with. Verse 4. For there were certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, <clears throat> turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, that's lustful, sensful, uh, sexual uh, uh, desires, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> in other words, we're talking about here, and you'll see it in a moment, fallen angels. Those that, those that follow Satan, and because they followed him, they do turn away from the truth. They're not interested in it. And for their actions, you, menace, you see he mentions uh, ordained to this condemnation. What that means is, for their actions, for what they did, <clears throat> God has already judged and sentenced them to die. You'll see that. After, of course, he's finished using them. People think, well, why don't God just go ahead and wipe out Satan too? Because he's not done using him. He has a purpose for him too. <clears throat> Amen. Now, what he's saying here <clears throat> goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. And if you haven't read Genesis chapter 6, or if you haven't read it in a while, after this lecture, you should go back and read the whole chapter. When those fallen angels who followed Satan, listen to this closely, instead of being born of woman, which was God's plan for the flesh age, whereby each soul being born innocent would have an opportunity for salvation, they chose instead to leave paradise, which is heaven, and they came to earth without permission from God, and they seduced women, and in particular, the daughters and downline daughters and granddaughters of Adam. And what happened? Giants were born. Geber in the Hebrew. Genetic misfits. Very much against God's plan of salvation. Goliath was one of those. If you want to know where he came from, that's how he got here. And right here, these fallen angels would lose any <clears throat> and all hope of salvation because they left the place where they were supposed to wait and be born of woman, but instead decided uh, they would depart, you know, and uh, uh, they would uh, uh, do ungodly things to women instead. Verse 5, <clears throat> I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, Jude said. In other words, I've taught you this before. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. He had to wipe them out. And this goes back to Israel's exodus from Egypt. And he had to take out a whole generation, listen to this, that refused to enter the promised land. Okay, And they all died in the desert. And because they would not believe and obey God, that's why they, God said, you'll die in the desert, and only their children would get to go into the promised land. Okay? <clears throat> now let me uh, warn you this with this. What has been will be again. He just gave us an example in the natural about what's getting ready to take place on the spiritual side of things. So I'm warning you what has been will be again. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very close to entering into our promised land. What is that? The kingdom of God. And by that I mean the millennial reign of Christ. So I got a question for you. Are you going to be one of those that enters? Are you going to be one of those who rules 
and reigns with Christ through that period. And if you are going to rule and reign, that's what you're planning on, as kings and priests under Christ during that time, then you desperately need to know what happened to that generation that died in the desert. Because this is going to happen again, only this time in a spiritual sense, through the time in the millennium. And this is why Brother Jude is, is, is calling these things to our remembrance so that these bad things like dying in the desert and not entering into the promised land doesn't happen to you and doesn't happen to me. It's a very important book. <clears throat> Let's take a Lachine break. I got a dry voice already. Are you ready out there? Got your water ready? Here we go. Lachine to life. Amen. <clears throat> and according to Revelation 3 <clears throat> and verse 7, these are Jesus' words, our Father is able to open that door to the good things of the kingdom with what? With what he calls the key of David in your hand. Well, what is the key of David in your hand? The key of David in your hand is the knowledge of God's Word that you have in your forehead, which is what opens doors, Jesus said, that no man can close. And He said, it closes doors that no man can open. Woo! It's the knowledge that, of God's Word that you know and understand. Verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they're going to get judged. They're in a holding place called Tartarus right now. After they pulled this, God put them in a prison deep in the bowels of the earth. And, there, and there's, the word's only used one time in your Bible, and it's Tartarus. It is a spiritual prison with spiritual chains for fallen angels only. Okay? <clears throat> and when is this great day of the judgment of these fallen angels? Well, it's real simple. It's, the, it's what the Bible calls the Lord's Day. Or in other places it says the Day of the Lord. And anytime you see the Lord's Day or the Day of the Lord, Old or New Testament, it's talking about the day of Christ's return. That's what it's talking about. And the Lord's Day begins with, you guessed it, the second return of Jesus Christ. Now, in Revelation 11 verse 13, you go back and read it later. On that day, the day of His return, okay, it reads that 7,000, that's how many of these fallen angels that came down to seduce women, 7,000 fallen angels <coughs> will all die on that day of Christ's return. Why? Because they violated the very plan of God by departing paradise without Father's permission, and their judgment day is going to be right there and right then the day of Christ's return. Poof, they're gone. My friends, it does not pay to not follow God's plan. And when God shows you a way, and then you take another path, not good, my friends, not good at all. So, after the overthrow of that First earth age. Are you with me so far? Are you enjoying this? Yes. Okay. After the overthrow of that first earth age, and with the beginning of the flesh age well underway, Satan's plan was to send these angels to earth to seduce the daughters of Adam through which Christ would ultimately be born. And just as Satan himself first tried to destroy the birthright of Christ through his seduction of Eve in the garden in Genesis 3, chapter 3, but he failed. His next attempt at destroying Christ's birthright, this is attempt number two in the flesh age, would take place in Genesis chapter 6 through those fallen angels who Satan would send. He dispatched them. Satan would send 
to take wives. Now this is right from Genesis chapter 6 and verse 2. It says that they would take wives of the daughters of Adam and giants were born. Genesis 6 verse 2. Hmm, I spent a lot of years in church. I never heard any of this. But ladies and gentlemen, it is in the handbook. <laughs> and when you study the whole book, you got to study the whole book. Amen? All right. Which is why, because of Genesis 6 2, is why God sent Noah's flood. That was the reason behind it. Which was to wipe out those hybrids, those giants, those geber, so that Christ would be born of the perfect bloodline straight from Adam himself, 75 generations down Adam's line, right to Bethlehem, to the birth of a baby that they called Emmanuel, God with us, the birth of Jesus Christ, thereby qualifying Jesus Christ as the sacrificial lamb without spot, without blemish, who would be sacrificed. He would be the perfect sacrifice, Paul said, <clears throat> for the sins of the entire world. And he was, and he did, and he got it done, and he became Savior of the whole world. Hallelujah. But you can see how the devil was given it everything he had. See, because God's plan in the flesh age, you must be born of the water. That means you must be born from a womb sack. That come from a womb man. We call him woman. That's where it comes from. Okay? <clears throat> so the devil was trying hard all the way down through there, see? Verse 7. Another example. He gives us another example. So, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them. there were I think there were seven in all. I might be wrong. It could be nine. <clears throat> There were hundreds of thousands of people. I can tell you that when you add all of it up. <coughs> Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. Now, I don't have to explain that to you. You know what that is, right? And going after strange flesh. Now, you may not know what that means, but if you've got a concordance, look up strange flesh, and I can tell you what it's going to tell you. That means same-sex flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I don't write them. I just read them. Okay? Hey, ladies and gentlemen of the world, it's your choice. However you decide to live your life, God's given us all free will. But, you knew there'd be a but, at the same time, Sodom and what happened there is our example as to where all this leads when you get involved with what God calls wrong activity. Verse 8, Likewise also, these filthy dreamers, who letting their minds just run wild on any and all misconduct, defile the flesh, hmm. and despise dominion. They despise God's dominion. That's what it's talking about and His plan. <clears throat> and, read on, they speak evil of dignities. In other words, they reject God's authority, what He said, and they reject His government, and many times they make fun of and they mock Christianity. They make, they make fun of us. Now, anyone who is involved in this kind of activity can change. Anyone. And here's how you start. You start by listening to God's Word. Alright? And then you learn to obey Him and take His authority seriously and worship His Majesty. And if you do those things, I promise you, my friend, good changes will take place in your life through repentance and forgiveness. If I've got anybody listening to me toying with those ideas or you're maybe already involved, look, I, 
I don't hate anybody. Okay? But what I'm telling you is if you want to get out of that trap, listen to this one more time. Start reading and listening to God's Word. And then obey what He says. And then realize He is the God of the universe. Take His authority seriously. And then worship His majesty. We praise Him for what He does. But we worship Him for who He is. Hallelujah. You do those things. You won't have to have somebody hammering on you. I don't hammer on people anyway. And I ain't going to start now. That ain't my job. But if you do those things, you can come right out of that mess through repentance and forgiveness. It's as though it never happened. Put your shoes on, put your head up high, and walk outside and know you're in right standing with God. That's the beauty of salvation that Jesus Christ left us. Hallelujah. Can you say amen out there? Amen. Now look at verse 9. Woo, there's a lot going on right here. <clears throat> lot going on. He's hopping around all over the place. Now watch. Verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, woo, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body, didn't say over, he said about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him, in other words, Michael did not bring against him a railing accusation. Why you dirty low down, no good, you know what? He didn't do that. But said... Read these four words with me out there in the home. The Lord rebuke thee. Woo! Now what does that mean? Uh. It means, I'll put it in plain English, don't ever argue with Satan. You're no match for him. Rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is way too slick for me and you. He's been around eons. He's slick. He's a scriptural doctor. He knows how to twist it. <clears throat> He's way too slick to ever have a conversation with. So just eliminate him right up front. Satan, in the name of Jesus, haul donkey! You need to get the point. But why would the devil be looking for Moses' body? That's a good question. First of all, Moses was God's lawgiver. <clears throat> Think about this. And Satan absolutely abhors and hates God's law. That's why he wanted his body. Now there's a lot being said here. Uh, it's just in this word, one verse. So rule number one in dealing with the devil, if you know it's him, okay, no negotiations. Right. No talkie. Get the blankie out of here right now. Here we go. Number one rule, dealing with the devil, say it with me, no negotiations. If it's good enough for Michael, whoo, it's way better for us. Amen. In, these last, uh, in, this, in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, you can go back and read it later, Moses supposedly died. But now if you listen to the Glory series, you know he was 120 and he was in perfect health. His eyes were good. Everything was good. But because God said over in Genesis, man's days will be 120, his time was up. So in Deuteronomy, last chapter, he, Moses supposedly dies. But let me ask you a question. Did God let anyone bury him? No, he did not. Did God let anyone know where his body was? The answer is, no, he did not. That's why Satan was all woofty woofty with Michael. God Himself took Moses. He would not let man touch him. Now, fast forward in your mind, just in your mind, to Matthew 17, chapter 17, and let me ask you another question. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 3, we're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Who was it that showed up that day on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus Christ 1,400 years after this Moses thing in Deuteronomy? 
you guessed it, it was Moses. But how did he get there? He was transfigured, of course. And it is clearly written in Matthew chapter 17 that he for sure was in a transfigured body on Mount Transfiguration with Christ and Elijah. All of them transfigured. So what happened? How did he get there? God took Moses just like he took Elijah. God would not let Satan near either one of them. And Moses came back on that mountain along with Elijah. Who's Elijah? Elijah is the prophet of prophets. And Moses is God's lawgiver. Now think about this. With the law and the prophets, what do we have? If you put the law and the prophets together, what do we have? We have the Word of God. We have the Bible. Of course. So, when God's Word tells you, do not argue with Satan, but let the Lord rebuke him. That's the way we need to handle Satan. Verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. <clears throat> but what they know naturally as brute beasts like animals in those things, they corrupt themselves. In other words, they destroy their own selves because they let their flesh have complete control. We just read about it. It was eating up their minds. They let the flesh have complete control of their mind and their body. Verse 11. What did you say about that? Woe unto them. Not good. For they have gone in the way of Cain, and Cain was the first murderer, and of Balaam for reward. In other words, what's in it for me? And perished in the gainsaying saying of Korah. And to, gain, to gainsay is to have a dispute, an argument. Okay? And Korah, being a Levite, okay, challenged Moses' leadership in the desert. And he said to Moses, in my words, I'm a better leader than you are, Moses. Korah said, step aside. <clears throat> One problem. One giant problem. Don't ever forget this. God chose Moses, not Korah. And God told Moses in Numbers 16, you can go back and read it later. God told Moses in chapter 16, Numbers 16, all right, Moses, you got a problem here. Divide the camp. Moses and his leadership, you get on this side. Corey, you and your leadership, your little band, you get on this side. Ah. And you know what happened. The earth opened up. If you watched the Ten Commandments, you saw those cats fall in the ground. and They were alive and they are screaming and yelling. <clears throat> 3,000 of them, I think, if my memory's right. And the earth swallowed up under Korah and his followers and swallowed them up alive. Not good. Verse 12. <clears throat> These, Jude said, are spots in your feast of charity. Your feast of love. In other words, they ain't nothing but trouble. <clears throat> when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. In other words, they don't have any respect for you. They just come and eat all your vittles for free. Clouds they are, he said, without rain. In other words, they don't produce anything. You find me somebody that doesn't work and doesn't produce. Now, I'm not talking about handicapped folks that can't do this. Now, I'm not talking about that at all. But I'm talking about if you're able-bodied and you're not out there working and you're not out there producing <whistles> something wrong, they don't produce anything. Carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, listen to this, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Ooh, what is twice dead? Oh, Jesus covered it over in Matthew chapter 10. He said it's the death of both the body and the soul. And that, my friend, is eternal. And those wicked roots, guess what? <laughs> They'll never be with us again. Hallelujah. Verse 13. He goes on about them. Raging waves of the sea foaming out 
their own shame. I'm thinking about William Shatner here when he went up in that space shot. My wife and I watched that, and I don't know if you saw that space. Uh, who's the guy with Amazon that sent? It was Amazon guy that sent that up. <clears throat> anyway, Shatner goes up with some other people, and they come down. He was complete. His mind was completely blown. He's one of our Jewish brothers. And when he came down, what he said was almost verbatim what this verse says. Listen to this. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. When Shatner came back, he was blown. We, my wife and I watched the live interview. He said, I got out there, I got off of this beautiful blue marble that God has made, shot off into space, and it was total blackness. Total darkness. And he said to himself, is this what death is? It was powerful. And again, you can read of this same event here in Revelation 11 verse 13, and when that seventh trump sounds, and Christ returns, those 7,000 fallen angels will die instantly in the streets of Jerusalem. They don't have to wait for the judgment. They've already been judged. Verse 14. Now watch this. Here's the other guy that gets transfigured. Jude puts all three of them in the same book. Not counting Jesus, just the three dudes, you know. Moses, Elijah, and Enoch. Watch this. And Enoch also, think about this. The seventh from Adam. You know, go over and Luke and read down the genealogy. He was the seventh one born down line from, from Eth Adam, the man Adam. Okay? <clears throat> Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying. Now he's going to give you a scripture that don't come up till Jesus gets here. He said, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Woo! Enoch was a preacher of righteousness and he was a prophet. During the time, think about this, seven generations down, he's right before, you know, he's, uh, he's right before Noah a couple of generations. Okay, here we go. So, <clears throat> he was a preacher and a prophet during the time that those fallen angels were taking wives of the daughters of Adam trying to do what they were trying to do and you know what happened? Enoch stood up against them. Mm hmm. And was teaching God's word. And you know what? A whole lot came against Enoch. Woo! So much so that what happened? God transfigured him also. Came down and picked him up and said, You too good to live here. Come with me. Amen. And Enoch was not, the Bible says, because God took him. Always stick with God's Word. And I'll tell you what the lesson is here. He'll always take real good care of you no matter what the opposition is. Amen. Amen. And Enoch prophesied, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of His saints to do what? Verse 15, talking about the return of Jesus, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds. Talking about the millennium, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. Ooh, God remembers all of this. And you know what? And I thought about this and I thought, you know, it is hard when you love God. You love His Word, and you, know, and you know what the prophecies are telling us. <laughs> oh man, it's hard to watch the evening news and not be upset with all the godless activity that they throw before us day after day after day. You know what? It can kind of wear on you. And if you're not careful, it'll kind of oppress you. And the first thing you know, you know, you're kind, of, you're kind of down. I've been there before. But here's what you need to do during those times. You need to keep this in mind. This too is a sign. And when you trust God, 
and you have faith in Him, irregardless of what's going on around you, you're in good shape, friend. You are in fantastic shape. And you've got absolutely nothing to worry about. That's the truth. This is God from God's Word. So don't let the ungodly affect your joy. Turn it over and watch the Three Stooges or something. You know what I'm saying? I mean, once you get the news, you know, and, you, and I'm guilty of it, sit there and I watch the same report four times over, you know, all that does is make me four times more mad. So I switch it over. I watch Gomer Pyle, you know, and I watch Green Acres. And I kind of get my mind back, you know, and get my joy back. You say, well, that's a funny way of getting the joy. Well, I don't know if you watch Green Acres in a while. It's so stupid. It's got to be funny, right? Amen. Verse 16. Now watch this. The, the, here's, all, here's all this degradation going on. All these people involved in all kinds of misconduct with their bodies and their minds. Okay? Now verse 16, old Jude's going to tell us what they're really like. Are you ready? Let's find out if they're just happy and full of bliss because they get to do what they want. Mm -mm. These, he said, are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, <clears throat> and their mouth speaketh great swelling words. Yeah. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. In other words, the only time they're you know, nice to you it's when they're blowing smoke up your skirt because you got something they want. In other words, the people who walk after their own lust at their core, this is God talking, not me. He said they're not happy. Mm -hmm. The truth is they're probably angry. Why? Because their flesh cannot lead them. They think it can, but their flesh cannot lead them to true happiness and true peace of mind. Only God's ways leads to true happiness and true peace of mind. Verse 17, But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, so we got them, they're not happy, you know. Uh, why uh, who should walk after their own ungodly rest or I'm sorry lust now this is also recorded and we just did both books of Peter not long ago it's also recorded in second Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 3 you may remember it hadn't been that long ago and Peter tells us that these mockers hey they're going to come dude just get ready for it and here's what they're going to say. Oh, He's not coming. Jesus ain't coming. Things continue on today just as they have from the very beginning. And of course, they don't understand what happened in the beginning. And so it's just going to go on the same way. So you might as well live it up and just do whatever the blank you want to. To heck with them. But also, in this third chapter of, of uh, 2 Peter, this is where we learn of God's three earth ages and His three heaven ages. It's in your Bible. And it's the same earth, but it's going to go because He puts it through three major age changes. Okay? And it lets you know. Here's why you want to know about the earth changes. It lets you know what to expect through those changes, each and every one of them, that either brings people to God, or because of their own lust, it causes them to turn and walk away from Him. That's how important those three earth ages are. Verse 19, These be they who separate themselves. Now, listen to me here, because I know there's folks out there that get under a guilt load because they don't understand this verse. Please listen closely. These be they, the those who aren't content, who separate who? Themselves. Sensual, having not the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit of God. Okay? And because they don't have the Holy Spirit living down inside them, which is what happens when you're born from above, 
They can't hear God's Spirit when He speaks. And here's what they do. They separate themselves from those who do have the Spirit. Now here's where the guilt comes in on a lot of folks. But I'm going to tell you something. You've got folks that separated themselves from you that are doing their thing and you're over here trying to serve God. But you need to know this. You did not do that. You did not separate from them. They separated themselves because, listen to this real close, that's what they chose. End of story. Now you'll be there if they have a turnaround or if they ever want to talk. But don't get under a guilt load because of something they chose. You understand? Verse 20. But you, beloved, oh, I love this, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And that just simply means talking to God. Talking to our Heavenly Father. And what are we going to talk to Him about? We're asking Him for His wisdom and we're asking Him for His guidance. Paul said in Hebrews 11 verse 6, But without faith, it is impossible to please our Heavenly Father. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, that He exists, that He is real, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And you do that by getting into a, a study of your, of your Bible on a regular basis, however your schedule works. So the mockers are going to come. In fact, I already see they already arrived. Okay? Uh, but when you know the Word, then you can clearly see that we are getting very close to entering our promised land. And those mockers that you see on TV, you know, blank, no, we won't go. Blank, no, we won't go. they got to make it rhyme. It has to rhyme or it's no good, you know. They're just a sign. I'm getting close to the promised land. Woo! I'm getting excited. <clears throat> Verse 21. <coughs> Keep yourselves in the love of God. For the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And by doing that, my friends, you gain eternal life. Rather than having your name blotted out of the book of life. Verse 22. Now, now he's going to tell you how to, handle, how to sift through the, the crowd. And on some or of some, have compassion on them, making a difference. Okay? And from our last lecture in 3 John, we were introduced to a man named Gaius, who was part of God's election, and it tells you how he took good care of not only God's ministers, but also the strangers that traveled through his city. He had compassion on them. And to have compassion means that you care. Okay? You care about helping others like Gaius did. And compassion, listen to this, compassion and love is the common denominator amongst God's elect. Period. Verse 23. And others, save them with fear, he said. Mm, you know, some of them you got to, you know, hey, this is what he said, you know. When it calls for it, you tell them. Pulling them out of the fire. Woo! Hating even the garment spotted by their flesh. So, you try to lead some to salvation with fear by snatching them out of the fire. And on others, you have pity. And you help them. But either way, I can tell you this, you're going to fear and loathe those garments spotted by the flesh because <clears throat> polluted by their sensuality. Because the things of the flesh are enmity against God. That's what His Word says. Verse 24, you know, we're going to drop this flesh robe pretty quick. You know, I ain't going to have to use deodorant no more. And do all that other stuff. Because I'm going to get me a brand new body. So are you. Hallelujah. Verse 24. Now unto Him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. Why? Well, how can He do that? Through the blood of Christ. 
before the presence of His glory mm, 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 with exceeding joy. And that, my friend, is why you don't want to go by the way of Balaam, what's in it for me, or Cain, murdering people, or Corey, hey, trying to take a spot that didn't belong to him. But what you do want to do is hear the voice of the words of God's Holy Spirit, your comforter. And what does that do? It keeps you from falling. It keeps you from falling out of grace with God into that darkness where there is no life at all. Verse 25, To the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Boy, he ended it good, didn't he? And that power, majesty, and dominion belongs to God and to Him alone. However, and this is what this book's warning you about, there will be one that will be coming that will claim to have that power and dominion, but it won't be according to the Word of God. It will be coming directly from the lion tongue and the lion lying mouth of Satan in his role as Antichrist when he gets here. Pretending to be the real Christ. And many people will fall for his lies and deception. But, good news for us. People like Brother Jude, who lays it out for us so that we have a good understanding as to how this flesh age ends and how to prepare for it. How could you beat that? I mean, you can't even buy that. You have to get this from God. Okay? So that we will not be deceived. I said, so that we will not be deceived. Period. That's how we know. Jude, the brother of Jesus. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And what a fantastic job brother Jude did <laughs> in laying all this out for us. And he only wrote one chapter, but it's power back. Amen. Now, I hope you enjoyed that. <clears throat> A big shout out tonight to Vicki and her husband from Joplin, Missouri, <clears throat> who wrote and said, we're really enjoying the Dove Point lectures. Okay? And I, I thank you for that. And we on this side are so pleased to hear about your spiritual growth and the good things the Lord is doing in your lives. We're excited about that. Amen. Thank you so much, Vicki and husband, for taking the time to write us. And the study materials you requested are on their way. My wife sees to that. So you may even have them by now. But if not, it'll be this week. And if you would like to write us and share what the Lord's doing in your life, we would love to hear from you. Just send it to this address right here. Now, the Dove Point team here, we're going to take a short time off. All right? And we'll be back, write this down, July the 23rd. We're going to take a short vacation here. Enjoy the 4th of July and all that good stuff and, and you know, do little things that we want to do. We'll be back July the 23rd with a brand new lecture. I ain't going to tell you what it is. You know why? Because I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> the Lord ain't told me. i got like three ways to go and I'm, I'm waiting to hear from Him. You know what I'm saying? But I want you ever one of those three it is. I know it's going to be good. So you don't want to miss it. So, big smile from all of us at Dove Point and our local congregation. We thank you all for watching. Have a great 4th of July holiday and may the Lord continue to bless your outreach for Him. Till next time, my friends. Shalom and Shalom.